Come on. It is my pleasure to welcome back our friend, Reverend Jacob Birch. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Reverend Jacob Birch, um, he has over 30 years of pastoral ministry experience. He has served in the ECD office, which is um, the sub kind of region that we're in of our denomination. He has served at the National District Office that covers all of Canada. Um, he is currently the senior pastor of Rouge Valley Church, and he's also my ordination coach. I'm, I'm going through the ordination process right now, and he's my ordination coach. Um, one thing that I've discovered about him during this process of him being overseeing my ordination work is he's someone that has a passion for God's Word, hence three scriptures this morning. And he, he, he has a passion to see the church anchored in God's Word. So um, with that, would you welcome back Reverend Jacob Birch as he shares God's word with us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're here today primarily as your children, adopted into your family because of the work of our older brother, your son, our Lord and Savior Jesus, in whose name we gather, in whose name we've worshiped, in whose name we've read your word, in whose name I now preach, Lord, and we all, myself included, want to listen for you, Holy Spirit, to come and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, 118 times is a lot for a word to be used uh, in any book, but in particular, it's a lot to be, uh, for a word to be used uh, in the New Testament, which today uh, we so confuse its meeting. Uh, you might say that you are meeting today in, where, where are you meeting in today? You're meeting in a church, you're meeting in Toronto, Jaffrey Chinese Alliance Church. When you say you're meeting in the church, what are you calling the church? You're calling the church the building. Well, I want you to know that 118 times in the New Testament, from, uh, from you know, the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus first mentions it, all the way through uh, to the book of Revelation, not once is the word that we now define as these four walls, the word, the Greek word ekklesia, translated in our uh, English language church, not once is it ever equated to a building. It's always equated to a, a gathering of people, people who are called together for a purpose. Uh, one of its uh, earliest uses is in uh, Acts chapter 19, verse 32. And if you've got your Bible, turn there with me, please. And I'd also say it's um, a secular use of the word ecclesia. Please understand that the word ecclesia church is a secular word. It, it did not have a religious connotation or meaning in Jesus' day or certainly in Paul's day. It began to develop that because of, of Jesus' use and the apostles' use of it to talk about the people who were called out of the world to follow Jesus Christ. But here in Acts chapter 19, verse 32, we have one of the sort of original uses of the word that we now call and use and translate as church. Paul is in uh, the city of Ephesus, and he's getting in trouble. You know, I'm a little bit sad about the ordination uh, process in the Eastern Canadian district for people like Ken and even like myself when I did it in the last century. Uh, I'm a little sad because nowhere in the ordination process does it say, in order to be ordained, you must get arrested. Uh, it's really unfortunate, because that seems to have been almost a sort of requirement of the early uh, church leaders. Paul is in the city of Ephesus, and his preaching has raised such a concern that he's been dragged into the, one of the nearby theaters, and there has been an illegal ecclesia, an illegal gathering of people there to sort of decide his fate. And we read about this in Acts chapter 19, verse 32, and some of the people who were so upset by Paul's preaching cried out one thing. Some of the people who were upset by other aspects of what he said cried out something else. For the assembly, there's the word, ecclesia, uh, was in confusion. 
So it's the people gathered together in this case who are in the confusion. The, a building, a theater, a chapel, uh, an assembly hall, these cannot be confused. It's only people, as we're aware, who can be confused. And most of them, the people in Ephesus, did not even know why they had come together. So this word that we, in a way, so misunderstand is actually so clearly used in the New Testament. Uh, ecclesia as the red circle, no smoking circle around the church building behind me shows, never refers to a building. That's why today uh, I want to talk about the fact that the church are a who, not a what. The church are a who, not a what. And in fact, based on our uh, three passages we had uh, read for us today and uh, are so beautiful, um, Isaiah 53 and, um, and Mark chapter 10 and Titus chapter 2, uh, I want us to think about the people of the church are as people who have been bought, people who have been ransomed, people who have been freed uh, from the clutches of sin, from the world, and from our enemy. Well, bought by who? Look with me at Isaiah 53, as was read earlier today. Isaiah 53, verse 11. Uh, God is speaking here in Isaiah 53 about his suffering servant. Uh, we would say he's talking about Jesus, about the Messiah who will come and who will, very strangely, from an Old Testament point of view, he'll do three or four things. Uh, the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 will very clearly be the leader of the people. He will lead them out of bondage, secondly, but he will also, thirdly, uh, he will also suffer for the people. Uh, and then he will uh, ascend to heaven to return to the Holy One. But Isaiah 53, 11, out of the anguish of his soul, God is talking here about his servant, out of the anguish of his soul, this suffering servant shall see and be satisfied. Note what it says here, by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, there he is, the Messiah, Jesus, by his, his knowledge, the righteous one shall do what? Will make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Well, bought by who? Who are we bought by? As the ecclesia, the gathering, the called out ones of God. We're bought by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Isaiah 53, verse 11. Bought by the Father in the sense the Father sends Jesus Look what it says there. The righteous one, my servant. God the Father talking about the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus. Jesus will say in, in John chapter 20, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. And if the Father sent his own son to suffer, it's no wonder that Jesus when he first begins to talk to his disciples about what it means to follow him, what does he say? All over the place, but Luke 11, for example, he says, if you want to follow me, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Deny yourself, take up your electric chair, if we believed in uh, capital punishment as our cousins to the south do. Deny yourself, take up your firing squad daily. Deny yourself, take up your hangman's noose. That's what Jesus is saying to Jews of the first century. That's the only thing the cross meant to the audience to whom he was talking about. The Romans, I won't say loved, but they took great delight in crucifying Jews. Numerous times in Jewish history, all of the men and young men and young boys who had followed Jesus would have been walking in or out of a town where they were going to pay taxes or do business, and they would have seen there on the side of the road criminals crucified by the Roman officials. Jesus is saying, you want to follow the, the suffering servant of the Father? If the Father has sent me to suffer, what does Jesus say, John 20? So send I you. The Father sends the servant. The Son suffers, and look what it says there in Isaiah 53, 11. The Son would suffer, look what it says there, to, uh, to, to make many to be accounted righteous. To make many to be accounted righteous. That second last phrase in Isaiah 53, 11. In other words, the many 
don't have any righteousness of their own. The many aren't included in the many because of any good works they have done. No, the many, the ecclesia, those who have been bought, are in many ways just like the people of Israel in Egypt, long-suffering there. And, it, and how did they escape their bondage? When God heard their cry, he sent Moses back to save them with his outstretched hand, with his mighty arm, pouring out taking plagues upon the Egyptians in order to secure the salvation of his Old Testament people. And of course, those people had very little uh, righteousness on their own. Almost immediately, almost immediately after every single miracle, there is some kind of rebellion, some kind of turning on their back of this God who has loved them. This is why when the Son comes and the Son suffers, he will make many to be accounted righteous, meaning he will change their status even if their life doesn't quite yet match up. We'll get to their life in just a moment. But this is the, the two parts of our salvation, as it were, that we are forgiven and we are justified, that we are forgiven of our sins, that we are accounted righteous. But this is where the Spirit comes in. The Father sends the righteous one to suffer. The Son comes to suffer, to, to, to forgive us, to account us righteous. And then look what it says there in the middle of uh, Isaiah 53, 11. Uh, it's by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, do this. And you know, you and I, because we're in North America, because we're in this kind of post-enlightenment era, when we see that word knowledge, we think information. You know, we, we go across the highway and we go to UTSC to get an education, and what we think that primarily consists of is information. Uh, my daughter is doing a semester abroad right now in Athens, Greece. And just in case you're wondering, Athens, Greece is seven hours in advance of us. So that means her her breakfast, you know, is at about one in the morning or midnight. Uh, her classes start, um, you know, for, for us, you know, nine o'clock her time, about two in the morning our time. And when do most daughters who are away from home have their most trouble? When do they have to go buy textbooks and need their dad to forward them some money? It's not in the middle of the afternoon where it would be early morning for me. No, no. It's one, two, three in the morning. Uh, now that she's in Athens, I have to, which I usually leave my phone on silent, but now I have to leave it on full volume so that I'm ready at a moment's notice to financially, emotionally, spiritually, in every way possible except physically support her adventure in Athens, Greece. And, you know, she's there acquiring many things, uh, but she's studying in the American College of Greece's business school, and she's there primarily accruing, you know, a different vantage point on business. What is the European view of, of small and large business? That's what she's there acquiring. Now she's also acquiring a real taste for Greek food. She's also acquiring uh, much stronger calf muscles because everything in Athens, Greece is either up or down. And when it rains, all of that marble gets quite slippery. So she's acquiring a few bruises as well. Uh, but that's what we think of in the West when we think of, when we see this word knowledge, we think information. By God's information to us, shall the righteous one, my servant, make many accounted knowledge. But that's actually not the Hebrew idea of knowledge. The word knowledge here, when we see it, we think information. It's a bit like the word church. When we see it, we think building. But I want us to understand in Isaiah 53, 11, knowledge here and throughout the Old Testament, the primary metaphor, the primary understanding of the word knowledge is not information, but intimacy. It's not facts, but relationship. So even here in Isaiah 53, 11, where the Father is speaking and sending the Son, and the Son is dying and accounting us righteousness and, and bearing our iniquities, forgiving and justifying us, all of this happens, it says, by his intimacy with us, 
by his connection with us. Well, who, who connects us with the Father and the Son? Who enlivens God's word? Who, who takes the information of God's word and makes it God's voice to us? It's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what Isaiah 53, 11 is saying. It's by the Holy Spirit's enlivening work within us when we were dead in our transgressions and sins, God making us alive in Christ like the prophet Ezekiel envisioned the valley of dry bones and God's Spirit blowing like a wind upon them and covering them with sinew and muscle and flesh and putting the breath of life into them again. Who has bought us? Who has brought us? Who has made you part of Jesus' church? of his assembly, of his called out ones, which like the assembly in Ephesus can sometimes be confusing. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have all worked in your life to have you part of this body today. Mark chapter 11, uh, Mark chapter 13, verse 11. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, you know, he doesn't say if they bring you to trial, and deliver you over. Remember, this is Jesus who, who was sent by the Father to suffer and told us we'd have to bear our electric chair, bear our hangman's noose, bear our cross daily. He doesn't allow there to be even an idea that an ordinary, much less a regular Christian, could be able to get through life without having to testify, without having to witness in some way for him. Mark 13, 11, what do we read? And when they bring you to, to trial and deliver you over, Do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit was working in and through Jesus' suffering to bring us to God, how much more is Jesus confirming for us that the Holy Spirit will be working even in what for some of us will be our darkest moment? God is there. I love what Billy Graham uh, had to say. Uh, Oh, I've sort of stopped uh, my, okay, yeah, I got a point back here. Maybe it's all closed down, shut down, turned off. Okay, oh, here we go. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, oh, these verses. Okay, Billy Graham, the church isn't just a particular building uh, or congregation, but the spiritual fellowship, to hear that word there, of all who belong to Jesus Christ. We're not here because of our background, because of our language. We're not here because we like the Bible or, or like uh, Pastor Ken, although I hope you are for all those reasons and more. We belong, as Billy Graham says, to Christ. We've been bought. We've been adopted into God's family, and we also belong beautifully to each other. This is why I'm saying today to us, the church is a who, not a what. Well, we've been bought by who? Bought why? Why have we been bought? Well, bought because of sin. Uh, This is what Isaiah 53 says, he shall bear their iniquities. We are in need of being accounted righteousness. And you know, our sin has two problems, at least with it. One is um, we live a terrible life. Sin has wages, the ultimate wage of which is death. Be sure your sin will find you out. God is not mocked. We reap what we sow in our bodies, in our emotions, in our minds, in our spirits, and for eternity if we are not careful. But that sin has a second, hidden, and in some ways more terrible result in that it separates us from God. And what did C.S. Lewis say? C.S. Lewis says the church exists for nothing else but to draw, and I'll simply update it a little bit, to draw people into Christ. That's why we're here. There's a lot of confusion in this day and age about what a church is and why a church is and where a church should be and how a church should meet and what it should do and Uh, I'm not interested in taking us back to the old-time gospel hour. I'm not here taking us uh, off into some new road. Uh, I've heard so many different definitions and attempts, and uh, even today in our own denomination and others, there's all manner of manifestations of the church. What I want us to see today are these what I call foundational and future aspects of the church. And the church primarily at its heart is a who— a who have been redeemed by the Lord, redeemed because of our sin, a who bought with what? 
We've been bought by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We've been bought, why? Because of our sin and separateness. We've been bought with what? Well, Jesus covered this in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. We had it read beautifully this morning. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. We have a terrible hostage situation playing out in front of our eyes right now in the Israel-Hamas war. 130-plus hostages remain, terrible degradation being visited among, upon the Palestinian people in Gaza. We saw, um, in many ways, terribly uh, in the hostages exchanges earlier that the basic ratio was kind of three for one, that one uh, Israeli would be ransomed for the price of three um, Palestinian prisoners. Well, in Christianity, in a way, it's one for one. Jesus gave his life for you. I sat in church like many of you for many years. I had grown up in the United Church. I thought church was great. I thought youth group was even better because at youth group, all the girls had grown up. And uh, I was so into youth group, even though I wasn't a Christian, I became the treasurer. I was really into the games. I was sort of into the Bible studies. It was great to go away on retreats. We would go down hills. We would go swimming. It was amazing. And I heard all about God's love. Shane Presbyterian Church in Stony Creek, Ontario. I heard all about God's love. I heard all about how he loved us. And, you know, I'm sure I heard in the years that I went there that he loved me but it wasn't until the Holy Spirit. One night in July, when I was about 16 years old, we were upstairs in this upper, very hot room of this old Presbyterian church, and a former student had come back, I think maybe because all the other leaders were tired of sharing the gospel, and he shared the gospel, a story that I had heard many times, the story of the lost sheep, and he used this sort of corny analogy that if we had all gone off on a bus trip and, and everybody was safe on the bus, but you were stuck in the lion's den of the zoo, Jesus would have come and off the bus and just save you. And even though the, the room was hot and the analogy was biblical but sort of corny, and even though he wasn't our usual speaker and I didn't really think it was any particularly fantastic sermon, there was just something about that night when I went from realizing that God died for us to that Jesus exchanged his life for mine. That Jesus had died not just for the church, not just for the world, but that Jesus had died for Jacob. Brothers and sisters, do you know that? Do you know that Jesus has given his life Yes, for us and for the church and for the world, but do you know that Jesus has given his life for you? You are part of the many, it says there in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. The Son of Man came not to be served, to be brought in and, and uh, feted and, and many banquets and all these things. That will happen at a later time, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And note it doesn't say all. Just like Isaiah 53, 11 doesn't say all. It says that many would be accounted righteous. I can't stand up here today in good conscience and with the Bible behind me, uh, let alone keep my credentials and my ordination, and say that this is for everyone because that's not what the Bible says. It's open to anyone and everyone. But not everyone will believe, unfortunately that Jesus comes to give his life for those who are willing to exchange his life for theirs. I love what Corey Ten Boom had to say about Jesus' uh, what he does for each of us. Be united with other Christians, she write. A wall with loose bricks is not good. The bricks must be cemented together. Oh, brothers and sisters, I'm worried about our churches. Our churches are full of a lot of loose bricks. 
You know, we've tried many things to, to cement our churches together in the Christian and Missionary Alliance and in the evangelical world. We've tried culture, we've tried language, we've tried service style, we've tried meeting time, meeting day, we've tried sanctuary style, color schemes, uh, worship, uh, you know, do we project them? Do we sing out of hymnals? Do we use organs? Do we use guitars? We've tried so many other things other than Christ. And yet it's only Jesus, not your pastor, not your worship style, not your background or language, not my culture or any culture that cements us together like Jesus does. And he does by exchanging his life for each one of ours. This is why Corey Ten Boom wants us to be united with other Christians. This is why Jesus prays in John 17. He prays for our unity. He prays that we might be one like he and his Father are, might be one in order that the world might know, he says. Now I'm delighted that we have opportunities where people can watch us at home or at some other time. It's amazing the opportunities church has now to reach people around the world and in our neighborhood who can't get here at 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning. But brothers and sisters, just because you're watching and worshiping at home, just because you're here, I want you to make sure that you're cementing yourself together with the ministry. Yes, come on Sunday, but what are you doing to serve? Yes, come on Sunday, but how are you fellowshipping with one another? Yes, come on uh, Sunday and worship, but how are you learning and sharpening and encouraging each other throughout the week? Do you have a WhatsApp group? Are you part of a life group? Are you serving in the nursery or in youth ministry? These are some of the best ways I know to begin to experience Christ because as Christ says, he came to serve, not to be served. This is why I say today, the church is a who, not a what, and lastly, lastly bought for what. We've talked about uh, why we need to be bought. We've talked about who's bought us. We've talked about bought with what, but lastly now bought for what. To what end? This is where Titus comes in and Paul's letter to, to the pastor he left behind on what is now the Greek island of Crete. To Titus he said, um, of Jesus, Paul writing to Titus, Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous of good works. Uh, what is it that we've been uh, bought for? We've been bought for freedom. Freedom from sin's power. Freedom from the separation between God and each other because of sin. We've been bought be purified, that our lives would evermore reflect the beauty and holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But look what else it says there. We've been bought to belong. We've been bought for to become a people for his own possession. God has brought you near. We who were not a people, the scripture says, God has made a people. We who were far off, God has brought near. This is why Paul's favorite metaphors for the church are not a building. They're, they're embodied metaphors. His first metaphor is he says that we believers are in Christ, meaning we're different parts of the one body of Jesus. And he uses this analogy all the time. The eye can't say to the hand, the hand can't say to the knee. But then he also says not only are we in the body of Christ, he also says that we are in Christ, that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. God has bought you in order that you would belong to him and in his family. But these are not the only reasons Titus 2.14 gets into as to why we were bought. We were bought for freedom. We were bought for purity. We were bought to belong. And you know the verse could have stopped there after possession. Jesus gave himself for, for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Period. End of story. We would love that because then you could just come here and sit and you could say, oh, I'm part of God's family. I'm here to be ministered to. Oh, come and give it to me, worship team and Pastor Ken and Pastor Gabriel. Praise God, I'm part of his family. But that's never where the Bible stops. 
certainly not where Titus 2.14 stops. A people for his own possession, and Paul continues, who are zealous for good works. In other words, we've been bought not just for ourselves, but for the world. We've been bought in order that just like Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. Just like Jesus came to carry his cross on behalf of people that he loved, we too have been called to suffer and to carry his cross into the world, lifting him up. Because as Jesus very strangely says in the Gospel of John, it's when he's lifted up as crucified Savior and Lord, then he will draw all people unto himself. It's in his weakness, in our weakness, in our service, in our failing attempts to love this community. It's then that Christ is most lifted up and glorified. So we've been bought for good works, not just for our own selves. Dietrich Bonhoeffer has beautifully said, the church is the church only when it exists for others. Mike uh, Strakura, a little bit more modern, has said, the mark of a great church is not its seating capacity. And do you see why? If Jesus had came to be served, then let's just sit and be served by him. But that's not what Jesus said. If Paul had stopped the verse after the end of the word possession, then yes, your seating capacity is the most important thing because the most important thing is being in the family of God. Amen? But that family becomes an army, an army of servants who go out in the world and give themselves for the world that God loves through them. That's why Mark Strakura says the great the mark of a great church. It's not its seating capacity, but its sending capacity. The Father sent the Son. Uh, Isaiah 53, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. I'll close with you by uh, quoting Augustus Tapladi's uh, 18th century hymn entitled, O Thou Who Hearest the Prayer of Faith. He was an Anglican priest and a bit of a poet. And uh, listen for some of these themes in his hymn. O thou that hearest the prayer of faith, will thou not save a soul from death that cast itself on thee? I have no refuge of my own, but fly to what my Lord hath done and suffered once for me. Slain in the guilty sinner's stead, his spotless righteousness I plead, and by his, and his atoning blood, thy righteousness my robe shall be, thy merit shall atone for me and bring me near to God. Verse 3, then save me from eternal death, the spirit of adoption breathe, his consolation send, by him some word of life impart, and sweetly whisper to my heart, thy maker is thy friend. This is why I say today, and I want you to go home knowing and living the fact that the church is a who, not a what. Are you here today and still in debt because of your sin? Maybe you've heard these uh, messages all the time, and for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit has taken my faltering words, this poor sermon, and for whatever reason, today is the day you realize God loves you. Colossians 2.14, it's time to get paid, brother or sister. He forgave us all our sins, Colossians 2.14, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. I don't want anyone to leave here today still in debt because Jesus has paid it for you. Are you going it alone? Are you like those uh, uncemented bricks of Corey Ten Boom? It's time to subscribe. It's not enough just to like. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube or Zoom, I'm not sure you can like things. Well, yeah, you can give a thumbs up on Zoom. It's not enough to give a thumbs up and to like. You know, a Toronto Jaffrey Chinese Alliance Church, I want you to subscribe and hit the bell icon. When you get that email from Caster Pen, don't say Caster, Pastor Ken, not Caster Pen. When you get that email, from, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. Most churches don't eat meat this early, all right? I'm trying my best up here. Uh, when you get that email from Pastor Ken, are you, are you reading it? Are you saying, how can I be more involved? Because that's what my Savior did for me. He didn't wait in heaven 
he came and served. Are you sitting on the bench here at Toronto Jaffrey Chinese Alliance Church? Then I would say it's time to get in the game. Ephesians 2.10 you doubt this idea that we were created for good works? What does Paul say to the church over in what is modern-day Turkey in Ephesus? He says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Brothers and sisters, the mark of this church that will make it great is not its seating capacity or its ability to make you feel comfortable as you sit, but like our Savior, the mark of this being a great church is its ability to send you, like him, out for the sake of the world. Let's pray together as the worship team comes to close. Heavenly Father, speak to each heart today what only your voice wants them to hear. If people need to come to Christ, then Lord, work in their hearts. Blow on that valley of dry bones. Help them who are dead in their sins to become alive in Christ at this very moment, Lord. Heavenly Father, others are, you know, as they sort of watch three or four sermons, they kind of go to two or three churches. They're not really subscribed anywhere. They're not really part of a, of a group of believers, you know, who are being indwelt by your Spirit and making a difference in this community. Lord, help them to Help them to go all in here at Toronto Jaffrey Chinese Alliance Church. And as I look out over this body of believers, Lord, I see just such incredible abilities, incredible skills, incredible giftings, incredible callings, incredible anointing on so many people. Father, raise up, I pray, Holy Spirit, right now, people who will come alongside Ken and Gabriel and the other staff and elders here and be part of getting in the game, Lord, of seeing the good news of Jesus shared with the people here in the east end of Scarborough and in Pickering and from here, Lord, around the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Jacob.